All right, let's do this. Friday the 13th, a series of horror movies starting in 1980, is an odd specimen. Usually, sequels to surprise horror hits milk the original formula to the point where the audience is sick of the premise, like Saw or Nightmare on Elm Street. Same villains, similar victims, new circumstances. Those franchises that gambled with their formula saw very little returns for the risk. So the rule of thumb became if it ain't broke, don't fix it, don't mess with the formula, don't change anything from the original. And then there's what Friday the 13th does. In the first film, Jason wasn't even the killer. He was a last minute jump scare. Also, the whole concept was made to cash in on Halloween's 1978 success. And with a 10,000% return on the budget, it was the most successful ripoff ever made. Critics panned it, and people loved it. To capitalize on the success, a sequel was rushed out the next year, turning Jason into the killer, putting a gunny sack over his head. Yes, it was stupid looking. However, it made back 20 times what they put into it, making it another box office smash. Year after year, film after film, Jason continued his rampage. Even the creators tried to end it with part four, but their efforts didn't delay the next film coming out just a year later. While the returns were diminishing, his killing spree could not be stopped. Seeing nothing but success, the producers went all out, doubling the budget from any previous Jason outing and securing on-site locations in Manhattan to shoot. Writer-director Rob Hedden was put on the project, though at this point in his career he only had directing credits on the Friday the 13th television series and had written a couple episodes of MacGyver. Note how neither of those are feature films. Regardless, they charged ahead with the plan, and in 1989 the world was subjected to Friday the 13th Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan. How could something already known for declining quality be such a major disappointment? It must be truly god-awful. Let's find out. We live in claustrophobia. A land of steel and concrete. Trapped by dark waters. There is no escape. Nor do we want it. We've come to thrive on it. And each other. Wait, is he describing our New York or Escape from New York's New York? Because this, this could really apply to either one. And I hope you enjoy that snippet of New York, because we'll be waiting 80 minutes to get back there. In the meantime, let's head over to Camp Crystal Lake. Because that's always a good idea. Hey, what's wrong? Nothing. Come on, Jimmy, something's bothering you. Just that we're right around that summer camp where all those murders took place. What murders? Pop quiz. You're hoping to have intercourse with a woman, and she's already undressing for you. So how do you woo her? With exposition about a mass murderer. Smooth. To sum up, Jason killed a lot of people. Until he died. And he's dead now, for sure. For the sixth time. <laughs> what are the odds of him coming back in some stupid, arbitrary way? First off, how is the anchor fighting that much with the gigantic power cord when the boat is stationary on the calm water? Second, why is that anchor so huge? This can't be an ocean-going vessel, they're on a lake! I mean, it's not like we see a seaworthy vessel just randomly docking in Crystal Lake's port. That would be completely ridiculous. I guess we should have been calling Jason's hunting ground Crystal Bay because this is clearly connected to the ocean. A Fresh Lake cannot take an ocean cruise liner! Ten minutes in, this has ruined the can of topography. Since the first two victims are dead, one getting stabbed in the ketchup packet, and the other dying from her incredibly lame hiding skills, let's meet the main character, Rennie. She's an emotional cripple that fears the water, which is why she brings along her dog Toby to the cruise ship. She makes eye contact with her dog once. That's how deep their bond runs. This cruise ship is taking graduating students from a local high school to New York City to celebrate. And their chaperone is a man who knows how to party. What are you doing here? I'll make sure that you remain on board while your classmates are out seeing the sights. And you'll do no such thing. I'm in charge here. The guards in Con Air were more jovial with their passengers. And here's the best part. He's the legal guardian of our main character. That's why he acts so warmly towards Rennie. It tugs the heartstrings. So, the stereotypes are all on board, cannon fodder ready for Jason to pick off one by one. 
he does this with the tamest series of kills he's ever done. Here's the entirety of JJ's death scene. <laughs> Nothing edited out there. He just swings a guitar that sprays blood at the camera and next scene. So when they budgeted this film up, did they forget to a lot for special effects? Apparently not. They just spent all of that on weird stuff that Rennie sees. While the rest of the kids are dropping like flies, Rennie has a very different series of interactions with Jason, including things like this. Toby, you can't run off! You're the heart of the story! Spoiler, she spends the rest of her time on the ship looking for Toby without ever finding him. I gotta get her out of the cabin somehow. While she's hunting for the dog, the audience gets to experience Jason's expanding powers. Since the last film, he's not only become wetter than ever before, quite a feat really, but he catches his victims without ever running. Or even walking. Jason teleports. Seriously. And if that latter scene wasn't enough to prove it, check this one out. Her reactions imply that he is in two places at the same time. She looks here, there, then back again, and sees him every time she turns. Jason Voorhees now has astral projection. He's showing her multiple images of himself to intimidate her into place, though none of these actually make physical contact. Those multiple Jason decoys freeze her in place long enough so the real one can magic in and strangle her. That's the only logical explanation for these events. Let's step back from the fourth dimensional killer for a second though and focus on the rest of these well-developed characters. This voyage is doomed. I think it's time for some recreational activity, girl. You're all gonna die. Jason Voorhees has been dead for years. You're all gonna die. Wow, that's a whole buffet of stupid to kill off. Oh, speaking of, has Rennie found Toby yet? When did Jason become Freddy Krueger? We see him stalking Rennie several times throughout the ship sequence, never taking lethal action against her. There's one attempt at strangling, but he gives up after she stabs him once. A courtesy I assure you, he extends to no one else during this movie. How did he shift his M.O. from straight up homicide to psychological torture? Is it just another power he's acquired? I mean, the franchise is famous for modifying its main killer throughout the course of its films, but this is a rather drastic change. Speaking of drastic, Jason sinks the boat. Yes. The villain, whose only weakness is drowning, decides to capsize the vessel in the middle of the ocean. Why would he do this? The surviving cast members scurry onto the lifeboat as Jason looks on. Seeing all his potential victims huddled in one helpless position, ready for the slaughter, he promptly teleports away. This leaves Rennie, the chaperones, the love interest, the boxer, and her dog a whole night to row the boat ashore. Wait, Toby's there? I know I jumped around a lot, but last I knew, Toby was still MIA. Even from earlier shots of the lifeboat, watch! Here, the downward angle on the lifeboat as they're all crawling towards it. Everyone's accounted for, except for Toby. Back to Jason, back to boat. No dog. Sideways angle on boat, suddenly dog. Did the dog jump down? Or just climb down the ladder? Maybe he learned to teleport from Jason. Hold on, rewind that! Jason, no dog. Jason, no dog. Dog, no Jason. Oh my god. Why didn't anyone see this before? Toby is Jason. I'm dead serious. How else could he get to New York City after he's on the boat that sinks? Jason pops up on shore after the rest of the victims dock the lifeboat. But since his weakness is he drowns and can't swim, it'd be moronic to write in Jason swims to New York. It's amateur hour. However, if he transforms himself into a cuddly human companion that they willingly bring along with the group on the rowboat, then he rides to safety. Toby is Jason's dog form. 
Just to be sure, let's follow Toby's plot from the beginning, see if the dots all line up. We see Toby walk towards the gangplank, but never up it. My theory? Still new in his dog body, Jason stumbles off the dock, landing unnoticed in the water where he has to scale up the anchor to join the ship's population again. Yes! Then he assumes Toby's form again, waiting for that opportune moment where someone goes way below deck, say, to make a rock video with her guitar in the, in the steam room, and then he takes his original form again to axe her with her axe. Oh god, that's a terrible pun. Anyway. He uses his astral projection to stalk the ship and search for more potential victims while continuing to exert his will over Rennie by being physically near her, when suddenly he finds something in her mind, something that terrifies him at a core level, his own drowning. That's why Toby sees the vision of Jason and flees from it. This all makes sense now! Jason lashes out against her because initially he's confused and afraid. Who wouldn't be? He hasn't thought about those things since forever ago. But. Now, he's feeling this closeness to her. That's why he's stalking her instead of trying to kill her, because he wants to increase his connection. It's the closest connection he's had to a woman since his mother. God. And he's using this to heal the psychic scar caused when his drowning caused his mother to go insane and get killed! <sighs> Who'd have thought we'd find this here? Jason's fear turns into a desire to protect her, shown by his act of aggression in Toby's body towards the robbers that take Rennie away from the group. Immediately after Toby's scared off into the night by gunfire, Jason appears and attacks these muggers, leaving a perfectly killable Renee B as he offs both of her assailants. There's no way around this. He's guarding her. And like all children, he's overly protective of his mother figure, which means he's going to systematically destroy all relations closest to her. That's why he takes her legal guardian and dumps him upside down in toxic waste. Why was there toxic waste there anyway? Did New York City have so much of it in the 80s they just put it into random barrels down alleyways? No, just skip the middle, man, and flush it down the sewers every night while you're at it. Can you help us get out of here? I sure can, but we haven't got a minute to spare. What do you mean? Toxic waste, son. The sewer floods out with the stuff every night at midnight. Less than ten minutes from now. There's plot contrivance. There's deus ex machina. Then there's pants backward crazy! Regardless, Jason is about to kill off her love interest, finally taking her for his own, when she beckons him to chase her. During this time, he never harms her. He even has ample opportunity to strike her when she throws toxic waste on his face and lets her run right by without a scratch. He's only pursuing her to try and complete that connection to heal his own damage, to remove that childhood curse that somehow drives him to keep existing in this constantly killing state. So when a grown-up maskless Jason cries, Mommy, don't let me drown. he's totally purged himself and lets the toxic waste flush away any psychic residue that remained from that damage he received as a child when he drowned. When the tidal wave of toxic waste subsides, Rennie and her boy toy stare down at a little boy's body, supposedly Jason's original form. That's totally crazy, so this is obviously just another decoy projection, as Jason, once freed from his drowning curse, teleported from the sludge back to street level. What proof is there of this? Your dog clearly survived a night unattended in New York City, then miraculously followed your scent through the sewers that toxic waste had recently flooded. <laughs> Toby is clearly Jason, and he's just waiting now for the opportunity to kill off her boyfriend so he can have her all to himself. This is let me in all over again, and what a twist. What appears on the surface, a rushed, half-baked film that went on far too long in all the wrong parts, Jason Takes Manhattan is truly the final chapter. Jason gains enough powers to convince everyone, even the audience, that he died at the end of a series of totally implausible events, all masking the fact that he orchestrated everything, including his newfound pet human's undying love for a dog she only gained that morning. This is an unsung masterpiece of fantasy manipulation. Either that, or I've totally snapped and filled in major plot holes with ramblings fitting a conspiracy theorist. I don't think that's the case, though. I would know if I'd gone insane. Hold on, I have to check something. Yes. Yes, it makes sense. DM and the other anthro are obviously the same person. 
Both have deep voices. One wears shades to hide his menacing red eyes and a hat to ride that long hair. And I've never seen them together. Except at role plays, but that could be a psychic projection. It all fits.